my dad was in the car and got a phone call from an industry publication and they asked him to define success. And he defined it as taking advantage of the opportunities before you without sacrificing your priorities. I think that's critical is really defining what your priorities are so that when those opportunities present themselves to each of us in our various organizations, we can evaluate whether or not they're the right opportunities to go after. Welcome to Get Unstuck and On Target, the weekly podcast that offers senior leaders insights and strategies to not only lead with confidence and vision, but also to achieve groundbreaking results. I'm your host, Mike O'Neill. I coach top-level executives on the power of ethical leadership to forge teams to be as united as they are effective. In each episode, join me for insightful conversations with leaders just like you, providing practical advice to help you get unstuck and propel you and your company forward. Let's get started. Joining me is Judah Regenstrife. Judah is the principal of Regency Supply. It's a family-owned and operated company that was co-founded by Judah's father in 1983. And from the beginning, they've been focused on building a company that doesn't compromise its priorities in the pursuit of growth. And it's that notion of healthy growth that I'd like to spend the bulk of our time on. Welcome, Judah. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here and uh, and an honor as well. I, I appreciate the the opportunity to share our story and uh, and be here on your podcast. We've had an opportunity to speak prior, and I got to know you a bit better. I get to know your organization better, and I was impressed. But let me read to you, and I'm taking this directly from your website, but it reads, and I'm referring to Regency Supply here now. Our vision for our culture is to build a values-driven, people-centered company. That gets flipped in a lot of companies. Too often, the focus is on revenue growth instead of growth in the quality of each team member. We are committed to helping each member of our team become the very best version of themselves. Mm-hmm. You're nodding. For those who are not watching this on YouTube, you're nodding on that. Does that still kind of capture your take of Regency Supply? It sure does. It's um, you know, It's been a journey in that pursuit as well, I would say. Um, I've been full-time at the company for a little over 23 years. And um, no matter what the economic conditions we've found ourselves to be in as we've tried to to grow our company year over year, the pursuit of, of finding good quality people and growing our people and maintaining a positive, encouraging uh, environment has has always been a challenge, but has always been at the forefront of what we're trying to accomplish at, at Regency. So, you know, I know that Regency is a family-owned and operated business, and I've had the opportunity to work with family-owned businesses. Um, it presents a whole new set of dynamics, does it not? It sure does. It sure does. Uh, and we've got four of us that are are still in the business full time. I have. Uh, two brothers. I have an older brother and a younger brother, so I'm in the middle. And uh, my father, our father, who started the company, um, technically in 1981, uh, selling products other than lighting, uh, brought over his best friend, uh, Michael Goldstone, and they became partners and Regency Lighting uh, was formed in 1983. Michael has also retired along with my dad and his son-in-law is in the business. So there are, are four second generation uh, sons that are now running and, and operating the company. And though I would describe my brothers truly as some of, if not my best friends, um, I think in any relationship, maybe particularly in family relationships, there's always challenges. There's always differences of opinions and uh, perspectives and even vision you know, for the company and what direction we should go. But um, but we're committed to, to each other. We're committed to our business and and we work it out. And, uh, and so far, you know, knock on wood, I guess, if you will, um, but, but we're doing well in the environment that we're in. I was drawn to you as a podcast guest for a variety of reasons. One, you're very articulate. You express yourself so very well, but you also struck me as someone who's willing to kind of share a little bit about kind of what, what does it take to experience that? Now, the name of your company currently 
is Regency su- Supply, but prior it was Regency Lighting, which right. sounds as if you've expanded your offerings. Can you walk us through kind of what that looks like? Sure. Um, it actually was a- about uh, four or five months ago or so when we made the name transition from Le- Regency Lighting to Regency Supply. And the driving factor for that was about eight or nine years ago, we kind of looked across the horizon, if you will, of the lighting uh, only side of the electrical industry. And um, I would say we were probably top three, top five independent lighting distributor in the country. And so kind of felt like we were the, the big fish in a relatively small pond. And so we had acquired an electrical wholesale company um, called All Sale Electric that enabled us to get into another segment of the broader lighting and electrical category, if you will. And so that really opened up our eyes um, and doors to be selling additional products to some very similar customers. And so uh, over the years, as we saw that part of our business grow and expand, we realized that there was a a tremendous opportunity for us um, if we moved a little bit more toward that electrical um, supply side of the lighting and electrical industry. Um, and so in that, we, we started kind of forecasting and looking to the future and seeing, you know, what, what opportunities will we have as the economy changes, as our country changes, as uh, the political environment changes, and um, moving our business name from Regency Lighting, which implies lighting only products that we sell, to Regency Supply, we believe that helps to open the door to strategically go after not just lighting and electrical products, but at some point to include other products that we would say uh, you would find behind the walls, so to speak. Mm. So plumbing, HVAC, um, things like that. And so Regency Supply is a little bit of a um, strategic, prophetic uh, move for us for the future to allow our company to continue to grow. Good, I share with you, if I have a choice, I love working with growing companies uh, for a variety of reasons, but I also know that with growth sometimes comes growing pains. And when people think of, of growth, it can come in a variety of ways. There could be organic growth, which I suspect that y'all have experience. It could also include growth through acquisitions. Uh, was this the first major acquisition for the company? It was. It was. Okay. Uh, first and and hopefully one of many. Um, there's a, another uh, potential that we're working through now, maybe two thirds of the way through our due diligence process. Um, but we do believe that in order to grow at the rate that we both want to grow and, and candidly need to grow, um, to kind of offset inflation and rising costs of living and still be able to attract quality employees, uh, we need to make acquisitions, um, a strategic part of our focus moving forward. So. Yeah, I know that sometimes one of the challenges of growth through acquisitions is that if you're not acquiring a company that complements this culture that we've talked about earlier, it can prove uh, you know, problematic. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you're in due diligence, and I'm not asking for very specifics, but I'm going to assume given your strong culture as a company is that your due diligence is put in particular emphasis not just on the numbers side, but it also includes culture. Is that a fair assumption? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that we we learned a lot in our first acquisition, which I believe was around eight years ago, um, to where we acquired a company that had a very different culture um, than than ours. And so it, it took a lot of work, um, a lot of hard work. Um, and we, we tried to implement a Stephen Covey principle of seek first to understand, then be understood. And so even in an environment uh, or situation where we're coming in to acquire an organization, we um, we try to be as, an inten- as intentional as possible to seek first to understand their operating procedures, their personnel, their culture, what work didn't work for them before we then tried to implement or start to implement our own uh, processes and procedures and, and try to instill in them our own values and beliefs as to what we want our culture to be uh, as the new owners of of that company. Um, but it, it it definitely came with a lot of uh, tears and sweat and hard work. Um, I I don't believe that there are many of the original employees that are still within that company. Uh, we have to make some personnel changes, uh, significant personnel changes. Um, 
Uh, we brought over a number of employees from Regency Lighting to the the acquired company uh, to help with that transition of of cultural change. But it was um, it, it was an undertaking to say the least. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you mentioned Stephen Cuddy. Uh, I had the opportunity some time back to meet him, mm. and just that interaction made a profound impact on on me. You were quoting one of the seven habits. Right. Seek first to understand. I know that there's application in your due diligence. In what way have you applied that habit uh, in your professional role? Well, I, so my my current role within our organization is I oversee our national sales. And so uh, from a sales perspective, uh, I, I know I personally don't enjoy being sold to. Um, and so I, I try to learn lessons from my own experiences of, of someone trying to sell me something. And uh, I, for me, I, I personally appreciate someone that wants to get to know me first before they try to sell me something or push something down my throat, if you will. And so the, the principle of seek first to understand and be understood as I'm out with our sales organization trying to meet new clients and tell them the Regency story and, and why be, we believe that we would be a good fit for them as their lighting provider, I want to first understand, well, what are your pain points? What are your challenges? You know, what are, what are the, the problems that you're having within your organization from a lighting perspective so they don't come in with a little bit of arrogance and assume that their current lighting provider is no good or assume that they're having problems or assume that they don't like their lighting, um, which to me is a little bit of, a, of an offset if I'm them. Mm -hmm. I, I think I would prefer to be sold by somebody who first tries to understand what my, my situation is. Um, and so I, I try to apply that principle uh, you know, you mentioned into my professional life, but truly, and I know that you and I have spoke about this, I, I believe we did uh, earlier, it really applies to all of life um, in every relationship, marriage, parenting, you know, friendships. Um, and so I, I think it's it's one of my favorite Stephen Covey principles in his seven habits of highly effective people. You know, I'd like to go back to this notion of growth and maybe find, focus on what have you found are key to healthy growth. We, we know that there's a business case to grow, to stay ahead, if you would. But what have you all learned along the way that is just really key um, to assure healthy growth? Mm. That's good. There, We could probably be on here for a lot longer than the allotted time for this podcast on that topic. Um, you know, one of the things that we learned through COVID was and this is a little embarrassing to admit, admit for a forty-three-year-old company, um, but I think that prior to COVID, we were caught up in the excitement of revenue growth mm. and didn't uh, keep our eyes on profit growth as we should. And so I I think that's one of the biggest takeaways for us as we kind of revamp and or have revamped our organization and our strategically setting ourselves to be in a position to grow again um, is to make sure that we don't take our eyes off what the end goal is it, or what should be in any for business profit uh, for business uh, company which is profit yes and so I I think it's important as companies are growing that they make sure and it sounds silly and it sounds like this is kind of 101 um, but to really make sure that they're evaluating their profit levels that they're in healthy positions, and that they're not overextending themselves and chasing after revenue, um, and and from there we could dovetail into so many so many topics. But uh, but that was a big one for us, um, somewhat embarrassingly so to have taken you know this long to really learn that lesson. Um, but that was a big well, one, Judy. I appreciate the humility in the comment, and that it's it's embarrassing to admit the reality is that's where we do learn our lessons. Yes, it's a forty plus year old company, but COVID affected. Companies mm -hmm. and individuals in very, very profound ways. Now, we're talking about top line growth and bottom line growth yeah. and the criticality of not losing sight of bottom line growth. Let me ask the question a little bit differently. And that is let's say that those two are in balance. Mm -hmm. Have you found that there is also a, a temptation to grow? at a pace that is outstripping the organization's capacity to grow? Yeah, great, great question, Mike. And um, 
uh, a number of years ago, maybe 15 plus, uh, my dad was in the car and got a phone call from an industry publication and they asked him to define success at Regency Lighting. And he defined it as taking advantage of the opportunities before you without sacrificing your priorities. Mm. And I'll say it again because I think it's so profound, but it's taking advantage of the opportunities before you. And there's opportunities everywhere all the time, right? We could run after and chase after a myriad of opportunities. But the the kicker or the the defining moment, if you will, in, in uh, determining your success is going after those right priorities so that you're not sacrificing your priorities. And everyone has to evaluate and define their priorities for themselves. Some people, it really is just at the end of the day, they want to make as much money as they can and they don't care what the cost is. They don't care you know, relationally, they don't care physically, their health, they're just at the end of the day, they want to make as much money as they can. And candidly, that's never been uh, at the forefront of our focus at, at Regency. Um, and so I, I think I think that's critical is really defining what your priorities are so that when those opportunities present themselves to each of us in our various organizations, we can evaluate whether or not they're the right opportunities to go after because we're we're protecting whatever our priorities are, which which would be, you know, as some examples, our marriages, you know, our ability to to be present with our kids and and be a good father or a good mother. Um, it might be your involvement in your local community, um, you know, your your involvement, investment in some some nonprofit charitable organizations. Whatever those priorities are, um, those should be uh, at the forefront as you're making a decision to go after or chase uh, you know, various opportunities. So, is that one thing I can you know, okay. answered it extremely okay. well? Um, okay. uh, but just to kind of punctuate that point, my understanding is the the way you all kind of articulate your your values is you use the uh, uh, the word rise. Mm -hmm to represent relationship, integrity, service, and expertise. What I love about that is one, it's only four things. Mm -hmm. So it, if, if you're trying to commit these things to memory, memory, you can do that a little bit easier. Um, but with Rise, the assumption is, you know, we, we want to grow this company, both top line, bottom line. We don't want to do it at the expense of our employees, of our trusted stakeholders and the like. But inevitably, you get stuck. Yeah. Can you share an example where perhaps either you or the organization got stuck? And when that happened, what did it take to get unstuck? Yeah, it's also another great question, Mike. You should do this more often in these podcasts. Um, I love the question because uh, we'll all face it. Um, we'll all face it, I think, in every area of our life. Um, and I forgive me for continuing to bring back to a holistic perspective you know, on these questions, but it we get stuck in our professional life. We get stuck in our personal life. We get stuck in our marriages. We get stuck parenting, you know, what have you, um, our health, we can get stuck. So uh, I would say for for us at Regency, uh, certainly COVID, you know, presented an opportunity for us to to be stuck. Um, and and a lot of that had to do with just the effects of COVID and, and the shift in, in our economy and the shift in the way that people are working. Um, the fact that that uh, maybe even that we're doing a, a Zoom call, a, a video podcast, and not meeting in person, right? And so, uh, so for Regency, we had to shift our marketing efforts. We had to shift our uh, cold calling efforts um, to reflect that of an, uh, an economy or an industry that isn't necessarily working at the office anymore. And so, in in the olden days, um, our sales reps would get in their car and they would drive down to the downtown area of Los Angeles or Atlanta or New York or wherever we had a distribution center, they'd park their car and they'd walk into 20, 30 high-rise buildings, you know, looking for the building engineer. 9-11 um, actually, you know, happened to predate COVID, but 9-11 happened. And that actually shifted a little bit to where now there's high security at these buildings and our reps can't just walk in anymore. So, uh, so we, we had to figure out how to get unstuck in our sales efforts with new parameters, new guidelines, new security protocols set in place, and or again, bringing back up to COVID, a shift in the market where people are no longer working at their corporate office like they used to, you know, five days a week. And so, um, so we had to try to get a little bit more innovative with our emailing efforts, with our phone call efforts, 
Um, we're spending a lot more of our investment dollars into trade shows, networking events, um, to take advantage of when people are leaving the house or when they are leaving the office. So, um, yeah, had to had to be had to be a little bit more strategic in that regard. Where I think again before it was it was kind of a no brainer, just kind of get in your car and go, and and walk into an office and and meet an end user. Now we have to be a little bit more intentional um, with how we do that. You know, you mentioned COVID. Um, this podcast is an outgrowth of mm-hmm. COVID. Um, the world was stuck, mm-hmm. and I was just wrestling with how could I be helpful to clients. Or, yeah. and or others. And that was kind of the impetus behind starting the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all stuck. How can we help each other get unstuck? Yeah. That notion, however, it's carried forward post-COVID. I'd like to think we're in a post-COVID time. But what I'm finding is I love when you use the word a more holistic mindset. Um, Judah, I find in my coaching work, we do spend quite a bit of time on leadership effectiveness. Mm-hmm. And we're looking for metrics to help that executive really hit the numbers that he or she's trying to hit. But it can't be done in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Uh, These are um, spouses. These are parents. These may be grandparents. These may be community leaders. Is that you have to kind of step back and look at things a little bit more holistically. So I kind of lit up when you said it um, because it really does kind of speak to the challenge of leadership now. You're expected to be able to do anything and everything. That's right. That's and right. there's so much coming um, uh, at you. Um, Judy, you you brought up some things I'd never really kind of thought about, uh, just real practical things. And that is y- your way of selling had to change because the world changed um, around. Do you believe your company is stronger as a result of these changes? I do. I do. Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, the changes forced us for the first time um, to really look internally at ourselves and at our processes and, and procedures. It uh, really caused us to take a harder look even at our personnel. Um, though, you know, as we mentioned earlier, building culture has always been a priority for us. Um, I think in the midst of regular, consistent growth year over year over year, candidly, sometimes you get a little loose in various ways. And so we had to evaluate our our staff. And and uh, though, though we... we would still say that we had wonderful people. There were people that maybe didn't quite measure up to what our expectations were, and so um, we had to make some, you know, hard decisions and and let go of some people that we love very dearly and um, and respect and certainly wish nothing but the best for. But um, we had to kind of raise the bar as far as our our expectations, and um, some people couldn't couldn't raise their level of performance to where we needed them to be. So, um, yeah, it, it's it, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Yeah, I know your primary focus is on national sales. Mm-hmm. And what I understand national sales to me might be very different than in, in, in reality. But you're dealing with um, accounts that are spread geographically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm assuming those particular accounts, they're looking to you because they like the fact that you have a nationwide footprint. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we focus... Uh, pretty heavily in the retail segment. Um, and so any retailer where there's a central decision maker, um, where they're, uh, we, we've defined a national account with a central decision maker and more than 10 locations um, across at least two uh, state lines, if you will. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I think that uh, our multiple distribution centers is of value um, to retailers. Uh, restaurant groups would be another category within the national account segment. Um, that we go after, uh, multifamily developments, um, hotels, uh, hospitals, but really, again, any any um, entity where there's a central decision maker that would determine what kind of lighting products um, are going into the multiple locations. So central decision maker, uh, at least 10 locations and, and cross state lines. That is one of the cleanest definition of national sales I've heard in quite some time because oh, it's- good. I mean, it's, it, I, I get it. I hear it and I understand it. And yeah. it's easy to put them, is that a potential national sales account or or not? It's it's a filter to kind of look at things. Yeah. Judith, from your perspective, you've been doing this for quite some time. Mm-hmm. You've agreed to come on the podcast and kind of share a little bit about your story, your organization story. What might be some things you would like us to know about Judah, 
or about your organization that maybe we hadn't talked about? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I do, I do spend a lot of time with, uh, younger, younger people. Um, I, I enjoy, um, investing in the next generation. I had people that invested into, in me when I was in my, my earlier career in my early twenties and even into my thirties. I'm now the, at the tail end of my forties. Um, so I feel like I, I've got a few gray hairs here as well on my face. So I, I think I, I've got a little bit of wisdom, uh, you know, from my experience of life. Uh, been married uh, 23 years almost, and uh, two children. Thank you, two children, two daughters that are uh, both in college now. So I'm um, I'm also dealing as an empty nester, but um, but I, I I do enjoy pouring into that next generation. And um, you know, one thing even in my own personal journey, uh, we didn't talk about this, but my academic background is in cultural anthropology. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, which is where I also get some of the language of of kind of looking at life and business from a holistic perspective. Um, I would I would describe the discipline of of cultural anthropology in that in that it's a holistic um, view of of people's behavior. Um, and so, uh, I I like to pour into younger generation and let them know as they're trying to figure out their purpose in life, their meaning in life, to make sure that. They don't get caught up and uh, and too focused on maybe one particular thing or one idea or one dream. Um, I didn't I didn't grow up dreaming of selling light bulbs. Uh, <laughs> so it's uh, obviously it's uh, it's a family business, and you know my dad started it with his best friend, and uh, I didn't even necessarily grow up thinking I would one day work at the business, let alone uh, own it with my brothers. Um, but I don't I don't dream of of selling light bulbs. But what I do love is being with people. Mm. And I think sometimes uh, the next generation or all of us in that season of life are, are thinking that we have to find that one thing to do for the rest of our life um, and that we have to even love it per se. And uh, I think there are some that get to do uh, and or sell something that they absolutely love. But for me, it, it's about the people. For me, it's about the relationships. It's about the networking. It's about the industry as a whole. Um, and so I, I think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that answers the the question about me or not, but, um, but yeah, that would be what I would answer. I think it, it is a wonderful answer because it kind of, it's a reflection of you. Now you were just trying to, to justify our son went to college and he got a degree in what? Um, so you you very nicely showed how that is even relevant uh, today. Let me follow up on the offer of you are mentoring and you're kind of pouring into uh, those in a way similar to the way people poured into you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't like necessarily characterizing generations as all of them fit into a certain box. Yeah. But what do you feel that leaders get wrong about the generation that's coming into workplace now? Mm, great question. Uh, I would probably jump right back into a Stephen Covey principle and, and our favorite one of seek first to understand. Um, I think it's very easy for one generation to look down on, on another generation and uh, quickly judge and critique um, without first understanding that generation and what makes them tick. Um, I would say, you know, I, I believe I fit into the, no, I believe I'm, I'm a Gen X guy. And um, I think baby boomers and Gen Xers sometimes see the millennials and the Ys and the Zs and mm -hmm. um, and the next uh, in, a, in a negative light of they don't, these are some maybe um, generalizations, but they don't want to work hard or they don't want to come into an office or they want the fast route or you know, various assumptions and judgments that we've made. And, uh, and I think there's a lot more to that in that than maybe the next generations are, are uh, more willing to take on risk than maybe my generation was or baby boomers were, or they're willing to try things new uh, or try new things faster um, than maybe my generation or the previous generation was. So I, I think that's, again, a, a principle of all of life and in all of relationship, but as, as leaders, I think that we need to be careful um, in in prejudging or judging too quickly the next generation coming up 
Um, and rather than looking at them for what they're not, trying to see in them for what they are and who they are. Um, so I would I would say that's that's a, a miss that sometimes leaders uh, make. You know, we sometimes also think of generations and only think of a handful. There are potentially up to five generations in the workforce right now, mm-hmm. which is kind of staggering. You know, we opened this segment by which I kind of shared a little bit about uh, your culture and your core values. And I, I did so in part because as you're trying to recruit, you know, attract, recruit, and retain, at least what I'm finding, this is particularly true for those folks coming into the workforce now. Those core values lived out yeah. is of paramount importance to them. And- it's not enough to put it on your website. Right. It's not enough to put it on some pretty picture in a boardroom. Um, you have to live it out. And I think you, in our conversation, have given us a number of excellent examples where for the second generation, you all strive to live out those core values and really walk the talk. And I would think that that will serve you well mm-hmm. long term as you continue to build a, a thriving and growing organization. Mm-hmm. You know, Judah, we've covered a number of things, but as you reflect on this conversation, what do you want to be the takeaways? It's good. I mean, I, I appreciate what you just said, um, you know, about us. And, and I would say, uh, you know, we certainly are not perfect by any means. Um, and uh, though it's at, at the core of, of who we are, and it's at the the core of what we have printed and marketed, um, the rise values of relationship, integrity, service, and expertise, and and um, and we certainly try to do our best to treat everybody with respect and kindness and professionalism, and create an environment where people can grow and make more money and 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 grow professionally, et cetera. We're not perfect in that, and um, I think uh, I think a, a good healthy leader also understands um, and knows when to admit that knows when they when they miss the mark because uh, we all will you know for various reasons um external stress that may cause us to make poor judgments or internal stress um that that causes us to maybe make some poor decisions um of course you, you hope that you have some good accountability around you to help offset some of those opportunities to make poor decisions um but we're all in in various situations and scenarios where we just we have to make a decision in the moment and um and so I, I think that's important. Is that a good, healthy, strong leader uh, that is going to try to um, lead an organization successfully? Um, not only needs to be someone who can make the decision to chase after the right opportunities without sacrificing priorities, um, like we mentioned and defined, um, but also too needs to know and understand uh, when they do make a mistake and they need to to admit it, you know, and to show themselves humble before those that they lead, because um, I think that also is. Is the type of person that people want to be led by. You know, I, I think sometimes as leaders, we mistakenly think that we're supposed to have it all together, that we're supposed to never make wrong decisions, that we're supposed to have an answer for every problem. And uh, and I don't think that's true, and I don't think it's realistic. Um, I, I think that people are are yearning for authentic, humble uh, servant leaderships, uh, leadership, and so. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that's that's what I'd love to you know maybe conclude my segment on, or, or have people remember when they think of uh, of Judah Regan Strife or the Regan Strife family uh, and and Regency Supply is uh, obviously for your lighting needs. I hope people would consider you know Regency Supply who may be looking, but also too that we're a, a group of individuals that are passionate about what we do and and who we are and and who we work with, and uh, are committed to to some pretty core values uh, that drive and, and affect our, our day-to-day living. So I anticipated what would be a rich conversation. That's exactly what I experienced. Judah, if folks want to reach out to you and connect, what's the best way for them to do so? Uh, either email or cell phone. And, and I'm okay to give my cell phone you know, here on the podcast if you're okay with it. Um, I'm okay. Once you give it, and we're going to try to include it in the show notes. So I'm going to write it down as we talk. Fantastic. My cell phone number is area code 805-12-1543. And uh, and my email is just my first name, Judah, J-U-D-A-H, 
at regencysupply.com. Excellent. We'll make an attempt to include that uh, in the show notes as well as other content information to reach out to Judah. Thank you so much for spending time today. Uh, this has been a, a real treat. You, you bet, Mike. This has been a, an honor and a pleasure for me, and thank you for having me. You know, as I wrap up, I have a question for our listeners. Are people following you because they have to or because they want to? Uh, as a leadership coach, I work with executives who have a track record of success behind them, but they're now they're now feeling stuck. They're frustrated because they're finding that with each level of success that follows, the bar is set even higher. They're discouraged because what worked in the past is no longer working. My clients, despite all the successes in the past, are lacking the clarity and confidence to make the decisions needed to get to that next level. Through coaching, we work together to unravel hidden blind spots, challenge limiting beliefs, and establish a strong sense of accountability. So if feeling stuck describes you or someone you know, let's talk. You can go to bench-builders.com to schedule a call. So I want to thank you again for joining us, and I hope you have picked up on some quick wins from Judah that will help you get unstuck and on target. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Get Unstuck and On Target. I hope you've gained insights to help you lead with confidence and drive your organization forward. Remember at Bench Builders, we're committed to your success, your leadership excellence, and your strategic growth. If you've enjoyed our conversation today, please leave a review, rate, and subscribe to keep up with our latest episodes. This show really grows when listeners like you share it with others. Who do you know who needs to hear what we talked about today? Until next time, I encourage you to stay focused on the target and continue to break new ground on your leadership path.